Good morning, church. Welcome to the building. Y'all know, can't go to church and only be the church. Are you a friendly church? Are you a nice church? Are you a kind church? Not a mean church. Oh, good. I feel safe then. That's good. Yeah. Tag your it. We're the church. We've, we've inhabited a building. And, uh, we do welcome our guests who are with us on this Memorial Weekend. So good to see you all. I wore this shirt because uh, I'm uh, receiving offerings. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing a need to plan a church in possibly Bali, Tahiti, Bora Bora. And I'm... And, uh, so I'm needing uh, some offerings in order to do an exploratory church planning mission. <laughs> these people need Jesus in these places. And uh, so anyway, just anything you can give towards that. And I'll be happy to go explore and see if God would want us to plant a rock of KC in any one of those places. Some of you are like, yeah, pastor, could I be one of the families that go? Well, depends on how big the offering is. We'll see. <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, I, that uh, the idea has been hitting me, though. It really has. Since this shirt does it, it just inspires beach ministry. All right. Anyway. All right. Well, hey, listen. Um, it's International Month. The month of May has been International Month. Not really planned, but God planned it that way. Two weeks ago, we had Steve Parsons from London come and give us a, a great word from the Lord. Last week, we had Pastor Shane Baxter from um, Melbourne, uh, Australia, come and just bring a, a great word to us. And today, we have another Australian. We have back-to-back -back international Australian ministry. Come on. Um, falling in love with that country, falling in love with what God's doing, uh, falling in love with some great people there. And, uh, one of the pastors you've met before is Pastor Shane, whom I met, Pastor Jeff and Lee Blight from Life Church in Brisbane, beautiful city. My wife and I have become uh, becoming dear friends of ours, doing a great ministry uh, there in that region of Queensland and just really around the world. Uh, and so it's our honor to have Pastor Jeff and his wife. Lee, stand. I didn't have you stand last time, so please stand. The better truly... The lady who keeps Pastor Jeff anchored, um, but uh, I want you to stand and let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Jeff Blight as he brings the word of God to us today. Take a seat, y'all. We don't y'all in our house, in our, in our country. We just use. One person is a you, two people is a you's. How are you's going? That's how we do it. G'day. Yeah, you see, you can't do that either. That's one thing we've got. We can g'day. But uh, in our country, Philip, we say, how are you going? And Philip says, why do you say that? I'm going in the car. And uh, so, how are you doing? There you go. Hey, your pastors are so cool. You're so blessed. Yeah, let's give them some things. We just fell in love with uh, Philip and Susan in Australia. We took them. They've been in our, our church a couple of times and ministered there. We took them zip lining, which means that we su you're suspended by a harness on a metal rope that goes across the gully hundreds of feet in the air and what could possibly go wrong. And so we zigzagged across uh, through the woods there and from tree to tree, just like Tarzan. And they did it like veterans, which is outstanding. And then we went segwaying through, you know, segways? Yes. Super fun, super fun. So we just fall in love. You guys have got authentic pastors who love you and are living consistent lives. You need to thank God for them every single day. And you need to pray for them, not in some sort of weird controlling way. Pray for them like you just want to release what God's got for their lives. My wife, Lee, is, uh, we've been married for 34 years. Uh, that's well done, Lee. We uh, have two boys, and we'll show you a photo of that shortly. We've been pastoring our current church for 17 years now. Uh, there's the boys up there on this side here. We have Jonathan. He is our creative pastor at church now, looking after our marketing and creative ministries. There's me without the beard. I grew this beard so I could have a point of difference between me and your pastor. Too many bald, smooth, good-looking men in the house. It's confusing. 
So we had to just make a point of difference. That's my wife, Lee. That's the same wife I've got with me here today. And then my son, Samuel, our son, Samuel, and he's in IT and he's married Michaela, who's just the joy of our family. And I finally got me a girl. I had to send my boys out to hunt and bring home a house trained girl. And they've done that, which is really good. But uh, we've been at our, our church for 17 years. We have a school as well that takes children from three and a half years old all the way up to the end of high school, 17, 18 years old. Uh, we have nearly a thousand kids in our school and we have seen some really good growth in our church of late as well. What I'd like to do is, we're, I'm going to share a little bit of our journey. It's a, it's a bit personal. Uh, it's a message I don't share back home because there are people in our community who went through that as well and I don't want to sort of reopen old wounds. But we are going to talk about redeeming your challenge. And I believe that today God's going to set us free from hurt and pain and disappointment, unforgiveness, and allow us to start fresh again. So first off, why don't we have a look at the screen? And I've got a little video I'd just love you to have a look at. I'm constantly amazed at what God has done here at Life Church. Now, of course, we've got a north location we just planted, and we've got a location in central Queensland. But here in the south location, we have two campuses as part of our, our, camp, our location here. We've got our college, our schools spread over the two locations with our primary school, our elementary school here at this site in Golder Avenue, two kilometers down the road, our high school. And I look at that and I'm amazed at what God has done because I remember that this is not where we start. Wind back 10 years ago, we were short of space. We had a college that wasn't thriving and we had some significant leadership issues in our universe, especially with the college. Um, a decision was made concerning the college that really unleashed help in our circumstance. Um, it was a leadership decision. And what we had is a very public campaign against me as the pastor, against anyone who was close to me, and uh, a real division in the college that threatened to rob us of everything we have. Our small four and a half acre campus looked like being totally in jeopardy. God took us through that season, and while it was extremely difficult for Lee and I, we did see God take us through that. The church did survive, and then wind forward only a few more years from that. Three years after that, we hear that there's a site coming up for sale, and five years after that, we settled on 25 acres, five kilometers down the road, which has totally taken the lid off everything we do in our, in our school and in our church. Now we have 25 acres there where our auditorium is, our high school is there, our church has got the ability to expand on our smaller uh, heritage site, our, our four and a half acre site. And so what God has done here has been amazing. And the lesson I've taken from this as I look back is that Times can be tough, but on the other side of our perseverance, on the other side of our obedience, on the other side of our faith is God's breakthrough. At our darkest moment, in the middle of that challenge, it seemed entirely hopeless. I remember lying awake with Lee at night, my wife, and thinking, well, if we, it all disappears, we've got each other. Uh, it didn't look like God was listening. It didn't look like God was there. It didn't look like there was any way out. Looked like we were going to lose everything that the church had and had had for such a long time. And yet now we see God was faithful. We see that God did take us through. Uh, when the things I asked God to do in that challenge, He didn't do. And thank God He didn't because that positioned us, recalibrated us so that we could receive a miracle just a few years later. So you may feel like there's no way forward. You may feel like this is it's all turned to yoga and it's there's nothing good's going to happen with this. But I understand, understand that God works all things together for good. Even the toughest things, but I think actually especially the toughest thing, God redeems that and works it together for our good. The cross didn't look anything like a victory, and yet it's the ultimate victory of history. And on the other side of your insurmountable challenge is a supernatural breakthrough. On the other side of that supernatural breakthrough is your miracle and someone else's miracle. Thank you, Jesus. God has blessed us. You know, we now have two campuses in our south location that we have split our school over. We have four church locations happening on a Sunday. We've just planted a brand new fellowship about two months ago on the north side of Brisbane. And we have one in central Queensland, a very small town way out in the middle of nowhere. 
And uh, we have, you know, across that, we see about a thousand people on a weekend, and we've, we have got 30 acres of land, 10 kilometers out of the central business downtown Brisbane. Uh, we bought that block of land, 25 acres, for $10 million. Um, we now have about $50 million worth of buildings if we had to build them again. And you, people look at this and they say, wow, you're lucky. But uh, there was a journey. And you go back, you know, we've got two boys. My boys are the pride of my life. We showed them before, serving Jesus, serving God with us. And, but you go back to 2010 and we had a very difficult season. It was always in the college. It wasn't in the church. But there was a decision made about the leadership of the college because of some fundamental issues. And um, that didn't end well. That process was very painful. But, you know, I... I, you know, as I said there, I remember pacing the floor, praying for God to intervene, and, and he seemed like he was silent. Has anyone ever sort of reached out to God and felt like God wasn't listening? Because you can be truthful, you're in church. You meant to tell the truth. Um, I feel like there's some more people not quite telling the truth in church. <laughs> and uh, if you don't want to admit to God that you thought he wasn't listening, but he knew, because he's been around a long time and he's very clever. But uh, I just felt that God had gone and he wasn't listening. The thing is, he just wasn't doing what I wanted him to do. But as I look back, all of you know, our current miracle that we're living in, everything from that season was necessary. And so today I want to talk about redeeming your challenge. And I'm not here to uh, pretend that I've got the toughest challenge in the room. I just want to share some points from... Some, some lessons, if you like, that I learned in our challenge, but I'm aware in a room this big so there's been some fundamental betrayal. In a room this big, many of us have been hurt and, and, and our destiny sabotaged by people we should have been able to trust. Uh, in a room this big, there would be people dealing with grief for personal loss, relationship breakdown, and I, I understand that. And all the more reason why I, if I can leave some gems that can help you walk out of that rather than just continually walk in that, then we'll all be better. And we'll be better dads and better mums and better business owners and just better humans. And so, as we're going through this challenge, and uh, you know, it was a very personal campaign against me and against my integrity, um, very public campaign. There was public meetings that were organized to get rid of Jeff. The, the whole idea was, if you can take our, college, our school principal, we can take the pastor. And so it was a real rise up of, of the school against the church and a real rise up against me. I was the target of that and then everybody close to me. And the, the, the number one accusation was that I was a liar. And so anything I said would have automatically been a lie. I worked that out, so we didn't say much. We didn't get back on Facebook. We didn't say anything back to people. We didn't send people letters back that sent us, you know, we just didn't respond. Uh, because anything we said, could and would be used against us in a court of public opinion. So we thought, I'm not saying that. And, and uh, we just sought to move through it consistently. If you'd asked me before this challenge, what was my greatest asset in life, I would have said my reputation. What I learned in this challenge is that you can't actually guard your reputation because your reputation is what people think of you and you can't determine what other people think. All we can guard, we can determine our character. And you just do that consistently, and that will live down what they're saying about you. Just live in a way that makes people know that what they're saying about you is not true. And uh, so that's what we learned. And the first lesson we learned in this challenge was to trust God. Just to trust God. It's so hard to trust. Trust is only trust when it doesn't make sense. Look at this passage. It's in Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't depend on your own understanding. Seek to do His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't depend on your own understanding. Trust is only to trust when I don't understand it. If I understand it, then it's just common sense. Trust is trust when you don't understand. In the middle of our challenge, it didn't look like there was any hope and no one was really giving us much hope. 
uh, there was no one to defend us and the people we asked to come and try and defend us really felt that they weren't in a position to defend us because of the volatility of the situation. And the, the big threat was we'll take our kids out of the school, that'll bankrupt the school, that will bankrupt the church. All those things were true and we ended up about 10 students the right side of oblivion. And, uh, but we did, in that season, we did change the leadership of the school and saw supernatural growth after that, which allowed us to address the debt and, and position us for this miracle that we're living in now. But at the time, that's now, and I think we read Bible stories knowing the end of the story as we read the beginning of the story and not really imagining how desperate Friday would have looked before Resurrection Sunday. Look at this passage here in uh, Genesis chapter 1. I love this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this is all God. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. God had created, but it wasn't good yet. Every other stage of creation, as we read that chapter, when God said, let there be light, he saw the light and he said, it's good. But God didn't see the formless, chaotic world and say, it's good. But the Spirit was involved sometimes. We can look at our chaos and think that means God's forsaken us because we understand that darkness is associated with the other team, not with God's team. And so when darkness and chaos are reigning supreme, we think we're being either judged by God or abandoned by God. I certainly have had days when I felt like God was just not there. And yet the Spirit's hovering over our chaos. Today, if you're in a challenge and it doesn't make any sense and it looks like it's just chaos, the Spirit's hovering over your chaos. God is in the middle of your challenge. And then God said. You know, I look back and people think we're lucky now. People thought we were stupid then. We weren't as stupid as we were then and we're not as lucky as we are now. It's just that perception isn't always the thing. And then God said, there's been a huge miracle in our world that's just opened up a whole new season of destiny for our church. We've seen loads of kids saying yes to Jesus, giving their life to Jesus in our college. We've seen salvations in our church. We've been able to open new ministries that impact the community. We never had the space for that before. We've got employment clubs and before and after school and vacation care. It's, and we're just dreaming. What can we do? What questions in our community can we ask? We could never be in a position to do that before. Because God has gone ahead and God said, today, if you're believing to, if you're, I think in a room this size and in all of our lives, we all have challenges of trust. I'm struggling to trust you, God. Today, I just want to pray, just as we, before we head into the rest of, of today's service, before we head into the rest of today, we just settle that issue to position ourselves to hear the next thing. If that's you today and you're saying, God, I want to trust again. There's some chaos there. It doesn't make sense to me. And today, Lord, in the midst of that, I'm just choosing to trust again. I'm choosing to step out in faith and trust again. Just give me a wave. Put your hand up because we're just going to pray. Lord, today you see our hands lifted up to you. It's an act of surrender and acknowledging our need of you. Today, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness and we choose to trust again. In the midst of ambiguity, we choose to trust again. In the midst of pain, we choose to trust again. Lord, in the face of loss, we choose to trust again. Thank you, Jesus, for your unconditional acceptance of us. Amen. Second thing I learned in this challenge was to choose to forgive. To choose to forgive. And it is a choice. And, you know, in life, some people hurt you. They don't even know you're there. You know, someone cuts you off in the traffic. Don't get upset with them. They don't even know you're alive. Just go, oh, well, at least we didn't crash. On a motorbike, you'd be getting sort of paranoid about people doing that. But I've got this big twin cab. You, you'd call it a truck in this country. I call it a truck because I like to make myself feel good. And uh, this little lady in a little car just nearly drove into me. The other. I thought, I'm huge. But uh, I'm not angry with her. She didn't know I'm alive. She didn't mean to hurt me. So some people just hurt you by mistake. 
you know, just life happens, you just bump into each other, it's whatever, something said that wasn't meant to be hurtful, but it was hurtful, we need to let that go, because that was just, but some people do mean to hurt you. They come up after you, and in, in this situation, people were desperately trying to hurt me, the goal was to make me resign, or to get me sacked. That was where we're going, let's be crystal clear, and uh, I had to choose to forgive, even in the midst of the challenge. Because if I carried that, it was going to forever dominate my destiny. I didn't want my life defined by people who were cranky. I don't want my life defined by people who don't like me. I want my life defined by Jesus. So I'm not going to give my life, you know, person who hates me, I'm going to give you my life. No, I'm not going to. I'm choosing to live not how that is. I'm not going to define my life and my future by that. So I have to choose to forgive. I, um, I just want to give you a brief two-minute recap of the story of Joseph. You find the story in the whole second half, almost, or I think Genesis 35 to the end of the book, Genesis 50, you've got Joseph. Joseph was one of 12 brothers. His dad thought he was the best brother because um, his, his dad loved his mum more. There's a bit of a hint there. One wife's better. And, uh, and so he had several wives going at once and that created all sorts of issues. And he gave his son a fancy coat to point out that he was the favoured brother. And, uh, and so he, he kept him home when the brothers went out to look after sheep. Joseph was too precious for that. And so everybody, all the brothers didn't like Joseph. And to make it worse, Joseph had some dreams about his brothers worshipping him. So he, in his infinite wisdom, shared those dreams with his brothers. Hey, brothers, I know you don't like me much now, but you're going to worship me in the future. They didn't like that. Then he got another dream. He said, hey, brothers and sisters and mum and dad, you're going to worship me. So his brothers thought, let's see who worships who they sold him as a slave. He goes down to Egypt as a slave. No longer the favoured son. He's now just a nameless slave. But he's... Hand of God is on his life and he becomes a very trusted slave and ends up in charge of his father, his master's house. And, uh, but then someone accuses him of sexual misconduct, the, 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 his master's wife, he gets thrown in prison. Uh, it was a false accusation, but he's now in prison. He's gone from favoured son to prisoner. No expectation of release. God reveals some dreams to him. He interprets some dreams for some people. Um, one of them is meant to put in a good word for him. He doesn't. So Joseph's just rotting in prison until Pharaoh has a dream. Word gets to Pharaoh that this guy in prison can interpret dreams. And next minute, Joseph is in front of Pharaoh, interprets the dream, saves the nation, saves the world. It ends up bringing his family to Egypt. His family are then saved and grow and develop into the nation of Israel. And so the purposes of God are secured through this because he saved the world from famine. His family would have died out without this. And so everything turned around because of Joseph. But at the end of his life, at the end of the story, his father's died and the brothers are all uh, panicking that Joseph's now going to turn on them, which is exactly what I would have done. In fact, I would have done it a lot earlier than that. Uh, as soon as the boys arrived and bowed down to me, I think, yep, you're bowing and you're going to keep bowing. I would have... There's... But uh, they come to him and, and, um, and they say this to Joseph. They say, look, now that dad's dead, are you going to punish us? And Joseph replied, he said, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position. Look at that. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. And so he reassured them, am I God that I should punish you? What a great statement. We all want to hand out retribution on behalf of God. If that person hurt me, God, I'm going to, you need to get them back. But God's word is really clear. That's above our pay grade. We're just not equipped, qualified, or called to pronounce judgment on anyone. Because we're actually a little bit in need of judgment ourselves. If it wasn't for Jesus, we would be in great peril. So we don't want Jesus to do what's fair, because I don't want what's fair. Look at this, Paul. This is the Apostle Paul. I think Jesus is our best example of this. You know, Jesus is on the cross. 
He's not up in the air yet. He's just lying on the cross. They're nailing the nails into his hand. And as you hear the clink, 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 over that clink, 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 you hear these words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Not they don't know what they've done. They don't know what they're... He, he forgives us while we're still doing the stuff he's forgiving us for. Look at this. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Rome. And he says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. You know, loving people sometimes is awkward. That's why Facebook is so much better. Because they're not in your house. They're just away. And you send them the best bit of yourself. And you look at the best bit of themselves. So the fancy photo where you're at Disneyland of this wonderful family. There's no video of the argument just before or just after or even during the taking of the photo. It's a relationship at arm's length, but we actually are called to love each other. Bless those who persecute you. I beg your pardon? Bless those who, not just somebody who sort of did something and spilt a coffee on your lap by mistake, but someone who's actually deliberately, consistently persecuting you. You can't be serious. Don't curse them. Pray for them. Pray that God will bless them. And not like, God, I just pray you bless them. May the fleas of a thousand camels <laughs> infest their armpits. Lord, bless them with those fleas. That's not what we're praying. We're praying that God will do something for them that they'll really enjoy. And then when God does, you've got to be happy about that. God, bless them. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all you can to live at peace with everyone. So my job is to get on with everyone. And it says here, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. In other words, revenge, if there's going to be any revenge, is God's job. My job is to be friends with everyone. Sometimes we see that thing, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, or I will take revenge, I will pay back, says the Lord. We say, God, Trevor hurt me. Get him. Lord, vengeance is yours. Be the God of vengeance. But God is, says, no, you don't get to pray that prayer. You get to pray the prayer, Lord, bless Trevor. Lord, I pray that you for his kids. Lord, I pray you bless his marriage. Bless his job. Lord, may he just get a, a contract this week that just unlocks financial possibility in his world that's what we get to pray because that's the rest is be up our, above our pay grade and if your enemy is hungry feed him if they're thirsty give them something to drink in doing this you will heap burning coals on their head don't let evil conquer you but conquer evil by doing good never let somebody else's attitude and actions determine your attitude and actions when you do that you make them your saviour you make them your God. Don't ever let somebody else's behavior determine your behavior. That's what we do when we're three. You know when your kids are doing tantrums? I was watching my kids do tantrums. I still remember going, well, wow, that's good. I do that, but I'm better at it. I'm much more classy. I don't fall on the floor and kick my legs. I'm much more effective than that. But we're still doing the same tantrums. We're still behaving like little kids. See, our decision to forgive, it acknowledges that Jesus has forgiven us. It acknowledges that I need forgiveness. See, when I choose to forgive, I'm saying, God, I'm standing here in grace, and I choose to respond in grace. Jesus told a story about somebody who was, owed his boss a huge amount of money. His boss forgave him, and then he went out and he... Uh, refused to forgive someone who owed him a much smaller amount of money. We need to understand Jesus has forgiven us for everything we've ever done. We're just having to forgive someone for one thing that they've done. We need... What, the forgiveness we've received is so much greater than the forgiveness that we ever have to give, even if that is very profound. I'm not trying to minimise the pain. We need to understand that when Jesus asks us to forgive, it's actually his plan for mental health. Matthew 5, this is really just quoting Matthew 5. Paul is just quoting a passage in Matthew 5. Bless those who persecute you, pray for those who spitefully use you. That's Jesus. When I used to hear that, I think, well, it's easy for you to say Jesus. Well, what's, how easy was it for Jesus to say? We acknowledge that Jesus has forgiven us. I, I, I'm so aware. I don't want fair. I don't want God to get them. If he gets them, he might come back. He might decide he likes getting people and come back and get me because I think there's some things he could get me for. 
So I don't want Jesus to get in the sort of the mojo of getting. So how about you forgive them and me and we'll all go to heaven together. That sounds like a good plan. Second thing is when I choose to forgive, and it is a choice and it's a process. So we make a cho choice to forgive and then we pray to be able to forgive every day. But when I choose to forgive, I, I release myself from their offense. See, the thing is, when I can remember the pain, I can remember, when I can remember the event, I can remember the pain. If I can remember the pain, I can pick up the offense. So I can get hurt by you again and again, and we typically do that, don't we? We walk along the road muttering to ourselves. You know, what we're doing is we're reenacting that moment, wishing we'd had that line that they always have in the movies. You know, they've got that one liner that finishes it all off. And yeah, in marriage, I, this is for all the husbands, wives, you, don't need, you can tune out for a little while. The, 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 the one liner that settles all arguments. Yes, dear. There's less laughter than that. I expected there, but that's okay. I forgive you. But uh, when we choose to forgive, we release ourselves from the offense. See, if I, what I don't forgive, I actually bind to me. I end up rehearsing. I end up defining my life by it. I don't want to have my life defined by hurtful moments. I want my life defined by God's destiny for me, for my family, for my kids. So when I forgive, I release that sin from me. I don't tie it to me. I release it from me. And... Uh, and thirdly, when I forgive, I release the other person from any debt to me. I release them to step into their destiny, unencumbered by any of that. I don't want this event and what their choices they've made now to define their destiny. That's what Jesus said. Father, forgive them. Don't hold this against them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgiveness is so key for our mental health. We need to be constantly forgiving. If you've been hurt, then just every time you think of the hurt, just release and pray for God to bless them. And you think, well, they don't deserve blessing. No, that's right. That's what forgiveness is. It's grace. We don't deserve it. But we do it anyway because we want to be like God. In fact, Jesus said, when we do this, in Matthew 5, we become like our Father in heaven. So forgiveness acknowledges God's forgiveness of me. It releases me from the sin, the offense, the pain, the brokenness, and it releases them. Third thing we need to do in the challenge is to keep our eye on the miracle. You know, in the midst of this, it didn't look like there was a miracle around the corner. And yet, just one forward a few more years, five years after this, almost exactly five years after it, we bought that 25 acres for $10 million. The, school, the, the government, we had a one-term government that wanted to balance the books, a one-term conservative state government, um, like your Republicans. And uh, they sold the high school, and we bought it. They sold it to us. I can't understand any of that. We didn't think, except for a miracle, we know there was other groups that offered more money, but somehow they gave it to us. Massive miracle. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Keep your eye on the miracle. On the other side of your forgiveness and your choice to follow Jesus through your challenge is your miracle. On the other side of your miracle is someone else's miracle. On the other side of Joseph's obedience he was elevated and promoted and became in charge of all of Egypt. He had his personal miracle. And the other side of his personal miracle was a miracle for the nation and the nations, a miracle for the people of God, the establishment of the people of God. The ultimate result of all of that was Jesus Christ himself. Keep your eye on the miracle. Understand the miracle's coming. And God said, let there be light. What's God about to say in your circumstance? And God said, and God said. You know, the, the greatest miracle is we get to have a relationship with Jesus. It, it, it constantly amazes me. I don't see prayer as some sort of grudging obligation. I can't fathom the fact that I can talk to God. Like, we get to do this. I, we've just had a Christian prime minister, which is the effective equivalent of your president, We've got a spirit-filled Christian prime minister in our nation now, which is a massive miracle, and I would never have thought was possible. But I can't get him on the phone. If I tried to ring him up, he's not going to talk to me. I think Donald Trump wouldn't take my call. Um, I might tweet him, see if that'll work. And, uh, <laughs> but the Queen's not going to take my call, but Jesus does. In fact, in the morning, he's just waiting for me to wake up so he can have a chat. 
It amazes me. God talks to us. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, if today as I've been speaking, you're aware that you're not walking with Jesus, perhaps you have in the past, or perhaps you've never personally said yes to Jesus. I'm not really interested whether you've been attending church. Attending church is brilliant, but there's more. There's a personal, intimate, growing connection with the person of Jesus Christ. It's not just about doing for him, it's about doing life with him. If today you think, I just want to recalibrate, realign my life and get to know Jesus. Oh, I want to start walking with him. I want to pray for Jesus to do a miracle in your circumstance. So right now, if we could just all close our eyes just for a second, just makes it you and God now. There's no room here. This is just you and Jesus. You're saying, Jesus, I want to connect my life to you. I want to say yes to you. I want you in my world. I want you to heal my life. I want to, Lord, step out of pain and into your promise. If that's you today, just give me a wave. Put your hand up nice and high and say, yeah, I see your hands going up everywhere here. Fantastic. Keep those hands up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand together and pray together standing. All right. We're going to pray a very simple prayer of surrendering our life to Jesus. And if, you've, uh, if you put your hands up today, you own this prayer, pray it loud. If you're walking with Jesus and your relationship with him is white hot, pray this prayer loud. Because a prayer of surrendering our life to Jesus is always a good thing. So I'm going to say a phrase. If you say that phrase after me, that keeps us on the same page. Uh, it's not that these words are particularly sacred. It's just that we want to be together. Dear Lord Jesus, I reckon we can do better than that. That's, that I, I want some fufa. You know, I don't even know what fufa means, but... I want some of that. All right. Dear Lord Jesus, this is my decision to give you my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for healing me. I choose to live my life in relationship with you. Amen. Fantastic. Amen. Praise God. For those of you.